Thanks, Jeff. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here today. I kind of want to go back to the question that we were uh, posed with today, which is, will microbes save the world? A hundred years ago, uh, this would have been kind of the perfect question, equal parts insane and insightful. Um, but shortly thereafter, uh, let's see. Shortly thereafter, a uh, young man named Alexander Fleming came back from the front of World War I, where he saw most people being killed not by bullets, but by the infections that were produced by, by these wounds. And when he went back to his lab at St. Mary's, he discovered what we now know today as penicillin. And this is something that was produced by a mold and uh, that we still use to this very day. So, you know, will microbes save the world? Well, I would argue that in a way they already have. Uh, and, you know, they didn't stop there. In fact, just a few blocks from here where Zach was a, a graduate student, well, before his time as a graduate student, a team at UCSF uh, used the technology that allowed us to move genes from one organism to another to take the gene for human insulin, modify it, and then put it into bacteria and yeast and produce insulin in a way that had before been impossible. Before we had to grind up the pancreases of animals and inject this lysate into diabetic patients. And this was, uh, simply put, transformative. So again, you know, biology has uh, been a very powerful tool and we have used microbes to save the world for at least <coughs> some people. And this is, like uh, others have alluded to today, really just the beginning of the story. There are many, many products and, and many things out there that are produced using microbes. And there's a, a nice and zippy book that was published by George Church, Ed Regis, if you're interested in kind of taking a journey through the story. So microbes don't only save the world, they also delight us in small ways and, and big ways. Uh, beer, of course, um, is, as uh, Rob Carlson has said, proof that you know, massively distributed biological manufacturing works. It's also uh, nice you know, on a Friday. Uh, cheese is also a good example. So cheese, historically, had been produced using rennet, which is something that had been scraped out of the gut lining of young animals. Uh, if you go into any American restaurant, you'll see that, you know, we love our cheese and that's no way to produce, you know, at least at scale, this thing that we all love so very much or that a lot of us love so very much. Today, about 90% of the cheese that's consumed on this planet is produced using recombinant rennet. So that's just, you know, another small way that microbes have at least made our lives a little bit more delightful. And there are lots of other examples of this. Just you know, a couple weeks ago, I was talking to somebody, and uh, some, some of you were, were at that discussion. And we were talking about the enzymes that are present in laundry detergent, which are also produced recombinantly. And the bottle doesn't say with you know, enzyme X, which works at cold temperatures, or with enzyme Y, which will get that stain out of your shirt. It just says new. It just says brighter. You know, people care about these things because they just work, and they work in products that they use every day, every week of their lives. So I'd like to kind of refocus the question that we were posed with today and ask, you know, what are the challenges that we think are really important for the next 50 years that we need to address as a species, and how can we use microbes to answer those challenges? And the, the two things that I really like to think about a lot are resource abundance and, and resource stewardship. Um, and and those, are, those are really two sides of the same coin, uh, and they're what I think uh, are worth you know, like really spending our time on uh, for the next few decades. So at Gelzen, we think about a particular resource, food, and even more particularly, food ingredients. And what we're good at is designing, building, and deploying performance ingredients, and we use microbes to build things. So the first thing that we're building is gelatin. And this is gelatin that instead of uh, being made in the process that I can lay out for you in a second, uh, we produce in much the same way that rennet or insulin is, is produced. So how have we been making gelatin for the past few hundred years? Well, you start by growing a whole animal. That takes a long time. It's usually a pig, uh, oftentimes a cow. And then you take off all the meat, 
ship that off somewhere for people to eat, and you're left with scraps like hide and bone. Uh, people take the hide and the bone, and in the olden days they would boil it, but nowadays they drop it into an acid bath or a bath of base, and you leave it there for a few weeks, up to a month. Uh, and then you extract the collagenous material from these vats, manufacture it into gelatin, and then you produce delightful little candies or desserts or you know, yogurts, icings, exactly, it's mouthwatering. So in addition to being mouthwatering to some, uh, it is obviously inefficient. Um, it's becoming increasingly expensive and it's frankly gruesome. Uh, but it's a process that supports an industry that today is around $2 billion worldwide and is expected to grow to $3.2 billion by 2020. Now what we do just at the simplest level is engineer microbes to build gelatin for us. And as some people have referred to today, it's not just drop replacements that are interesting to folks. Although for large manufacturers, what they're very interested in is having a product that they can drop exactly into their process that they have been using for, in some cases, decades. Um, but this also allows us to tune the properties of the gelatin itself. And just very briefly to touch on the sorts of opportunities that building uh, proteins using this methodology opens up, you know, this is a, a safe process. This is something that we use to make drugs, right? Uh, this is more sustainable than growing up an entire animal. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is a material that you can now customize. So gelatin is essentially evaluated by its stiffness. It's called in, in food terms bloom strength. And in the system that exists, you need to take protein from a particular animal tissue. So if you want a very soft gelatin, you take the skin of a young pig because the tissue properties of the skin of a young pig lets you produce a, a softer gelatin. If you want a stiffer gelatin, you get the bones of an old cow because the tissue properties that exist there let you get those sorts of gelatins. Uh, that's just outrageous. And we can do a lot better by using microbes as factories and, instead of animal cells. And of course, you know, we need to be able to compete on the basis of cost if we want to achieve the sorts of things that we're interested in achieving. So this was something that I became interested in, broadly speaking, first uh, as a medical student, then as a graduate student. I was particularly interested in antibiotics as a resource that you know, we had to be good stewards of and, and something to kind of monitor going forward. But since then, it's grown into something really special, and this is the team that we're working with right now. So I think if you ask any, any of these folks, you know, will microbes save the world, I think that they would say basically what I just said. They already have, and you know, what's, what we're challenged with now is coming up with clever ways to, to address the, the big problems that we need to work out in the next few decades. So uh, you know, will microbes save the world? Maybe, um, and you know, we're trying to do it one gummy bear at a time, I guess. But uh, you know, it's, it's a really exciting time. You know, th just the past couple of talks have really highlighted why there's no more powerful tool than biology out there right now. And it's, it's a very exciting time to deploy that tool against uh, what we're excited about. So I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have now. Thanks for your attention.